the word. God is blessing us in mighty ways and we give the glory and honor to him. And today I have to bring the offering. So I'm going to let um, in purpose um, three verses nine and 10. And it says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Then he will fill your barns with grains and your vast will overflow with good wine. The first thing here that it says in this verse is we're going to honor God. When we honor God, the blessing comes. And not only that, it says with everything that you produce. So not only material, also spiritual way. If you honor God and you obey him in your offerings and in your tithes, that you give the first to him, you will see the blessing. Then in this two part in the second verse, it says, "In then he will fill your bonds. And bonds here, it's talking about the storehouse. It's not talking about bond. It's talking about bonds. So it means more than one storehouse. So if we have more than one storehouse and we're giving it to the blessing that God has given us to all those storehouses, because God is multiplying in different areas, is bringing that storehouse where it's for the needs, the ones in need, not only material, also spiritual, that we give them that need that we could feed them with the word that they could honor God, there will be a blessing. And then it says, it overflows with new wine. <laughs> it's not a little bit, it's not limit. It's, un, it's an unlimited thing. And it's gonna overflow so much when you honor God. And you give it with an open heart and willing heart, you will see the blessing of God. So today, our offering, our tithes, whatever we offer God, that it will honor him first and it will bless others in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, that our offerings, that our tithes, that when we give it, we give it with open heart and willing to honor you first so you could continue blessing others in mighty way. I thank you, Lord, because you have given me this privilege to bring the offering. I also present you our prophet, Wani, that she's going to bring that word. I can't wait, <laughs> guys, because it's going to be a blessing for us now that we're here in service and the ones in the future that will see it, that you will continue blessing us in mighty way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jackie. Can everybody hear me? Amen. As we um, get started with this word, I just want to praise and worship God. I worship our Father, not just one day. We worship him every day. Every day is our Father's Day. Why? Because every day he's good. The Bible says he gives us new mercies every morning. And so we just praise him. Um, before I get started, I just want to open in prayer. God, I just thank you for this word today. I thank you for what you're going to download and deposit to us. I thank you, Jesus, that you are a father that is better than any natural father. You are good. You are worthy. You are holy and you are mighty. Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you for blessing your people. I thank you, God, that you are meeting and will meet every single need. Father, your word says that you are high and lifted up. And as we lift you up, you will draw all men unto you. So Father, I ask that as I lift you up, 
with your truth, as I lift you up with what you've given me, as I lift you up with what you want declared, Father, that all men will be drawn to you, that, Father, they will come to know you as Lord, they will come to know you as Savior, they will call on you as Abba, as Father, they will know you as the one who's given his life for them. Father, I ask that through this word, you will heal, you will set free, you will deliver, you will touch us, God. You will touch us, God, as we touch this word, as we touch you, as we lean in, as we push in, God, you will touch us today, God. Have your way in this service, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. As I open up in this word, um, I just want to start by saying hello to everybody. Hi, New Wine. So glad to see you all on. My title today is The Father Knows Your Issue. And as you think about that title, I want you to think about what your issue is. Some of us have multiple issues. Some of us have issues that have been going on for a long time. Some of us have issues that no matter what we've tried to do, it just doesn't seem like it's doing anything. So what is your issue? Because the father knows your issue. And as we turn to the word today, we're gonna to be coming out of the book of Luke. I'll give you time to turn there if you want. This is Luke chapter eight, and we're gonna start at verse 43, Luke eight and 43. And I'm gonna be reading this starting with the KJV version, the, new, the King James version. I'm gonna switch at some point to the New Living Translation, but we'll start in King James Version. And as we go here, I wanna start by reading verse 43. And the scripture says, let me turn to it, excuse me. Thank you, Lord. And the scripture says here in the King James Version, and a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any. The woman had an issue of blood for 12 years. That's what it says in Luke 8 and 43. We need to understand that the scripture starts with a woman having an issue of blood for 12 years. In this scripture, we don't know her name. We don't even know where she came from. It doesn't talk about, a lot of times in scripture, it'll tell us the place that they came from. It'll tell us their background. It'll tell us their family lineage. Sometimes it'll say from the tribe of this or from the family of that. But in this text, we know nothing based on what it says. It just simply tells us that it's a woman. We know she's got an issue of blood and we know she's had it for 12 years. That's a long time to have an issue. We understand that what she's dealing with is severe because the word of God says that she's gone to many physicians, yet none of them could heal her. I want us to look at the definition of the word issue. And I wanna start with it from the Webster's Dictionary. And this was so powerful to me. In the Webster's Dictionary, that word issue, number one, the first definition is vital or an unsettled matter. So as you think about your issue, what's a vital or unsettled matter in your life right now? The second definition is concern or a problem. So what's an area of your concern right now? What's an area that seems to be a problem for you or for me? The third one is a matter that is in dispute between two or more parties. So what areas are you having disputes? What areas are you unsettled in this matter? What areas are you dealing between you and somebody else? That somebody else could be the enemy. That somebody else could be family. That somebody else could be a spouse. That somebody else could be a coworker. That somebody else could be a friend. That somebody else could be an enemy. But what is this unsettled matter that you're having an issue between you and two or more parties? The fourth definition in Webster's is the point at which an unsettled matter is ready for a decision. 
So an issue is the point in which an unsettled matter is ready for a decision. What areas do you have like that? where you're like, Lord, I just need a decision in this matter. I just need this to be rectified. I just need to get to some type of resolve. The fifth definition is a discharge as of blood from the body. And this fifth definition is what we're dealing with in the scripture. She had an issue of blood that was coming out of her body that was there for 12 years. The sixth definition in Webster says, an action of going, coming, or flowing out. And I want you to say that to yourself out loud. I want you to think about this and say, what is the action? What is the thing that's going on that's causing me to go? that's causing me to come, and that's causing me to flow out of something. Going, coming, or flowing out. The seventh definition in Webster, we know that seven number is so powerful, but listen to it from Webster's dictionary, which is a carnal dictionary. It says, to cause to come forth. <clears throat> Your issue, is causing you to come forth. That's what that meaning is. An issue is something that's causing you to come forth. Wow, how perfect is God that even the perfect number is in Webster's dictionary to give the real reason for the issue. To cause to come forth. Now I wanna read this definition in the Greek because it really is profound and it helps us to understand so much as well. The first definition in Greek says, the act of passing or flowing out. The act of passing or flowing out. It says a moving out from an enclosed place. So this issue that you have has kept you in an enclosed place. This issue that I have has kept me in an enclosed place. And the purpose of that issue is to get us out of that place. So in the Greek, that's what the definition is. It's talking about an act and something that's kept us in an enclosed place. Number two says the act of sending out. Ah, the act of sending out. Now, when we look at the word issue in the natural, we don't think about that. If I say to you, I have this issue or I have this problem or I have this thing going on with me, we don't think of this as a place that we're being sent out from. We don't think of this as an area where something's coming out of it. We think of this as an area where we're stuck in it, where we're bogged down by it. We got to look at it from the eyes of scripture. And so it says in the Greek that this is something which passes and flows out of. It is the act of sending out or causing to go forth. That word also means delivery. Your issue is bringing delivery. So when we think about delivery, I think about a woman that's pregnant and how she gives birth and how they go into the delivery room. What is God using your issue to deliver you from or into? That word means delivery. What is he using your issue to deliver you from or deliver you into? It also means here, the, um, the next definition of that word is, I love this. Number four says a discharge of flux. Also blood. So that word flux is also the same meaning for blood. So in the scripture, she had a discharge of blood for 12 years. The fifth definition in the Greek for this word is so powerful. And if you can write this down, this is powerful. It says a point in debate or controversy on which the parties take affirmative and negative positions. I'm going to read it again, and then I'm going to post something that God posed to me. A point in debate or controversy on which the parties take affirmative and negative positions. What situation in our lives have we taken a negative position? 
because we look at the issue as a problem. We look at the issue as something that we can't resolve. We look at the issue as a place that we're stuck in, can't get out of. So we look at it sometimes from this negative, affirmative, negative position. It's this debate. Why is it a debate? Because sometimes it's something that we debate in our minds. Sometimes it's something we debate with somebody else. If somebody else poses an issue to us, we're constantly going back and forth trying to explain or help them understand what our position is. So it becomes a debate. It becomes something that we're tugging with or struggling with to try to figure out how to get out of. But it says in the Greek definition, that we take a negative position. What have you taken a negative position in? I know the things that I can take negative positions in. And then the sixth definition in the Greek says, this is so powerful, the final outcome or result. <laughs> the final outcome or result. It says conclusion, event, test, or trial. What? Wait a minute, an issue is a test or a trial. An issue is a situation that's causing a conclusion. An issue is the final outcome of something that's gonna bring a result. So this issue that we're struggling with, God is saying to us, there's a final outcome to this issue. There's a final outcome to what you're suffering and struggling with and I'm the solution. Let's go back to the text. It says here in verse 43, I wanna read this again. And a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed by any of them. So she went to all these different specialists. She went to all these different people and none of them could heal her. We can clearly see in this verse that she had exhausted all of her options in the natural. She tried every doctor, she tried everything, she spent all of her money, she wasted all of her time and still had this issue. Who can relate to this woman? I know I can. There's been areas in my life where I've tried all kinds of stuff I went to this person and that person. I went to this doctor and that doctor. And I literally was this woman for four years that had an issue of blood. For years, I went to like eight different specialists and none of them had a solution. And I was exhausted and I was tired and I was frustrated and I was hurting and I was married and couldn't have a normal marriage because of this issue of bleeding. And so I could understand her position because this thing for her was 12 years. We sometimes can't even go through an issue for 10 minutes, but this lady did it for 12 years. Think about some of the issues that we're facing. Some of us have been in them for six months and we're overwhelmed. We're like, God, take this away, take this away. But this woman was dealing with this for 12 years. Can you relate to her pain? Have you been in her shoes? Are there areas where you've tried everything and the problem is still there? You've called everyone, but it didn't remove your pain, your problem. Not only that, it made it worse. There's been times where you called somebody and it just made it worse. Why? Why did it make it worse? This woman was desperate. She was out of options. She didn't know what to do. But the thing I love about this woman, even though she didn't know the solution to her problem, she knew who had the solution to her problem. Listen, we have issues and we have a solution. Christ is the cure. She went to the only one that was gonna be able to rescue her. She went to the father that never leaves anybody fatherless. She went to the king of glory, the God of all creation. She went to Jesus. And I love this text because it says here that she went behind him. I need you to see her posture in her desperation. It says in 44, she came behind him and touched the border of his garment. 
wait a minute, she didn't try to go in front of him. She didn't go to the side of him. She didn't try to go around him. She went behind him. Why? Because when we follow, when we go behind, that's where we receive what we need. We got to go behind and we got to get low. The scripture says she touched the border of his garment. It also says in the New Living Translation, and I want to read it from that because I like the way it reads. It's so powerful. It says here in 44, coming up behind Jesus, she touched the, frim, the fringe of his robe. So she touched the fringe. The very bottom of his robe is the area in which she was able to touch as she came behind the master. The thing that's so powerful is she was desperate and she heard about a man named Jesus that she thought to herself, surely if he's doing all these miracles, he can heal me. She said, if he's causing the blind to see, he can heal me. If he's causing the, the leprosy to be cured, he can be, he can heal me. If he brought a dead man back to life, he can make me clean and remove my issue of blood. She understood. I'm not touching any mere mortal. This is the one that has all power. She understood. I got to get close enough to reach him. I got to do whatever it takes to get to the bottom of him. I can't touch him physically. I don't want to touch his flesh. I just need to touch his garment. She understood that the garment has power because of the person that's wearing it. Wow, what a powerful insight and faith of this woman that she wasn't stuck on thinking, I got to touch his arm. I got to touch his neck. I got to touch his head. No, she said the bottom of him is just as holy as the top of him. His whole being is holy. So it doesn't matter where I touch, I'm touching holiness. We need to touch Jesus because when we touch the Father, we are healed from our issue. Oh, let's read this scripture a little bit further. I wanna read this part that says, in the, in the New Living Translation, it says, a woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She was a woman in the crowd. What does that mean? There were lots and lots of people there. She was not the only person trying to get a healing that day. She was not the only person that knew Jesus had what she needed. She was not the only person that was desperate for something. But what made her different than everybody else is that she understood his deity. She understood his ability to do what no other doctor before him had done. Do we understand that touching Jesus can do for our issue what no other person could give us a solution for? He's the solution. It says here that she pushed through the crowd. She came through the crowd. She did whatever it took to get to the hem of the garment, to get to the bottom of his robe. And I wanna talk about that because we have to be willing to get behind Jesus and follow him. We gotta be willing to crawl on the ground like she did to receive the solution to our problem. The scripture says she touched the, frim the fringe of his robe the hem of his garment. This is so powerful because sometimes we don't understand when we read that text, why that's so important. That area that she touched biblically is symbolic. It's not just an area to just touch. It's not because that's all she can reach. It was because that's the area that has so much significance. In the Bible, it says in Numbers 15, 38 and 39, Numbers 15, 38 and 39. The scripture says, speak to the children of Israel. Tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and to put a blue thread in the tassels 
of the corners and you shall have the tassel that you may look upon it and remember all the commands of the Lord and do them. And that you may not follow the harlotry to which your own heart and your own eyes are inclined. And that you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy for your God. Wait a minute. The tassels are the same things as this hem of the garment that she touched, as the fringes in which she touched. Now I want you to understand the meaning of these fringes as it says in Hebrew. Each tassel had eight threads. <laughs> we know eight is new beginning. When these tassels were doubled over, they had eight threads. And five sets of knots, five, grace. They had five sets of knots in the tassels. That totaled up to 13. The sum of all these numbers totals 613. Traditionally, those numbers in the command, those numbers symbolize the commands in the Torah. Because in the Torah, they had 613 commands that were given by God. So what was she truly touching? She was touching the word. She was touching the area that symbolized covenant with Jesus. She was touching the area that meant she had a promise from the Savior. She was touching the area that symbolically, biblically meant the place of his virtue, the place of his truth, the place that came from the father to him and through him. She was touching such a holy place. Somebody else might've said it was the bottom and they look at the bottom as beneath, but she understood the bottom meant the most holiest place to touch Jesus. It was the place of covenant, He touching him through covenant. That's what she touched. She touched covenant. She didn't just touch anything. She didn't just touch a garment. She was touching covenant. Covenant removes our issue just like it did for her. God's covenant to us as his children and our covenant to God to obey his word as we surrender to Christ. The only way we can obey his word is to surrender to the Holy Spirit who helps us to walk this thing out, who helps us to carry out the oaths and the commandments and the things that he said, the promises that he's given and the things that he's asked us to do. The Holy Spirit empowers us to do them. So she knew I got to touch this place so that I can carry out what God wants me to carry out. I got to touch this place so that I can be healed of this affliction and be who God created me to be. She was touching the holy place. She touched the part that represented holiness and authority to follow and do so. God's commands. Jesus was able to carry them out without failure. So she wasn't just touching any man's talent, which it is in the Hebrew. That's what they were called, this robe, this tunic. But she wasn't just touching any man's tunic. This was the Savior's tunic. This was the holiest person that ever existed. That's who she was touching. She was touching that portion of him that symbolized God's covenant through generations all the way down to their generation that she was in. She wasn't just touching a garment. She was touching the identity of her father. Oh God, she was touching the identity of her father. That thing blessed me because that word covenant means that there's something he's given to us. Pastor Angel preached on inheritance last week. When we have a covenant with God, we have inheritance from God. She was touching her inheritance. She was touching her identity. She was touching the place that removes what she thought and was releasing what she needed. What's your issue? Let Jesus remove what we think and let him give us what we need. 
We need more of him. We need his virtue. We need his peace. We need his love. We need everything that he is. She wasn't touching the dirtiest part of his garment, even though they walked on dirt roads and the garment would, she would have been touching, would have been touching the ground. It would have been dirty. And those garments were blue and white. So clearly a white garment on a dirt road cannot be naturally clean. But look at God. She was touching the cleanest part of his clothing. Oh God. She was touching the cleanest part because that was the part of covenant. That was the part of his will and his word. That was the part where he was releasing his truth to her. She touched the word written on him and in him. That's what those tassels symbolized in Hebrew. The word that they wore on them. And she was touching the word on him and in him because the Bible says the word wrapped himself in flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is the living word. So she was touching the word. And I love this next part. The scripture says something so profound after she touched him. It says in 45, who touched me? Just that one line is so powerful. Who touched me? Jesus asked. Everyone denied it. And Peter, you know, it's always Peter, right? <laughs> and Peter saying, you know, Paul always talks about Peter, but Peter says something that was so profound too. Peter said, Master, this whole crowd is pressing up against you. Ah, this whole crowd is pressing up against you. And Peter's like, how do you be able to tell who touched you when everybody's pressing against you? Think about it. It's a million people and everybody's pushing and trying to get to him. Think about the stores at, at um, when it's Black Friday and everybody's pushing and kicking and screaming and trying to get through the store to get to the deals. This was Jesus. He's greater than the deal. He is the best deal. So imagine how they were pressing and pushing and, and, and trying their best to get to him. But what Peter said was so important because the words that he used was amazing. He says, everyone in this crowd is pressing up against you. But Jesus said something after that <laughs> that shook me in verse 46. He said, someone deliberately touched me. Someone deliberately. So everybody's pressing against me, but they're not deliberately touching me. Oh, God. Are we deliberately touching Jesus? Huh, my God. He said, for I felt healing power go out from me. This woman didn't touch just the holy place of his garment with her hands. She wasn't touching Jesus with her hands. Everybody was touching him with their hands. She was touching Jesus from her heart and with her faith, she touched him with her heart and with her faith. The only way our issue can be resolved is by us touching Jesus with our heart for him and our faith in what he can do for us. She wasn't saying to herself, here we go again, another doctor that can't help me. That's not what she was thinking. That's not what she was saying. She wasn't saying, I'm just, I'm just going to see another person. I'm just going to deal with another negative report. No, she was saying, I'm touching the physician that created me. I'm touching the one that can heal me because he made me. Oh God, are we touching the one that can heal us because he made us? Thank you, Jesus. The story is real to me because in 96, when I flatlined, Jesus brought me back and healed me. And ever since that day, I've never been the same and I've never suffered that again. So when he 
releases his virtue to us. The scripture says, Jesus said, I felt healing go out from me. When he releases the healing and it goes from him into us, we are changed. This woman was changed. She was understanding that this physician can touch me like all the other physicians could not touch me. They tried to help me, but they weren't my help because the Bible says that Jesus is our help. He said, I'm gonna send you the comforter and he's gonna help you. He's gonna teach you. He's gonna empower you. So she was dealing with the help. They weren't help. They were just people that she went to. She now was dealing with the help. We need to understand that the father knows our touch. He stopped and he said, who touched me? Who? Who? He knew it was a who. He knew that this person that touched me touched me unlike anybody else that touched me. All these people that are around me, they're not touching me. Know that your faith can reach heaven. And even though a billion people call on God, he will respond to the one that touches his heart with their faith. Billions are calling on God, but they're not touching God. They're calling on him, but they're not touching him in the right way. Oh, he said this and this messed me up. Peter said, the whole crowd is pressing against you. Jesus knew there is only one person in this crowd that's truly touching me. Pressing up against him is demanding something from him. Touching him with our heart and faith, expecting from him is two different things. If we're pressing up against him, that means we're doing something by force. But if we're touching him, it means we're doing something through love. Think about that. If you press against something, if you press against my hand, I'm doing that with force. But if I touch you, if I touch you, I'm touching you with love. I'm touching you with an understanding that you deserve me to touch you in a certain way. That's not going to bring pain. That's not going to cause you any harm. I'm touching you in a way that's going to make you feel good about my touch and not make you feel unhappy about my touch. So she was not just pressing him. She was touching him. That meant she touched him with love. She didn't touch his body because she knew she was considered unclean because of her bleeding. In this day and time, having periods is normal to us. We don't even understand that as being unclean because to us, it's just a normal thing, but it wasn't normal to them. In those days, bleeding was considered unclean. It was a big deal. Women were rejected and cast out for having this issue. And I want to read a scripture to you in Leviticus 15 and 19. It says, when a woman has a discharge, and this is the amplified version, when a woman has a discharge, if her bodily discharge is blood, she shall continue in her menstrual impurity for seven days. And whoever touches her shall be unclean until evening. Wait a minute. The person that touches the woman is unclean. And it says the woman with this menstrual issue, as the word said it, this issue makes her unpure. What? I had an issue of four years. She had an issue of 12 years. She was considered to be unpure in the Levitical law. She understood that now I'm unclean because I've had this issue so long. She didn't want to make him unclean because for 12 years, everywhere she went, she was told she was unclean and dirty. She had no physical touch from anyone because of her issue. Can you imagine 12 years? You can't hug your family. You can't touch them. You can't be around them for 12 long years. 
she could not have physical touch. So touching Jesus was the first touch that she had in 12 years. Oh God, this is the touch that I want. I want that touch. I don't care about touching a man or touching a person, but if we can just touch Jesus, oh God. How many of us suffer the issue of loneliness and rejection like she did? When I read this, I thought to myself, she was afraid to make Jesus unclean. What a thought and that some of us sometimes have. We think just like this woman, my issue is too great. My situation is too dark. The issues I deal with, the struggles that I face, the sin that I'm in, it's too much. I don't wanna cut this off on him. I don't want him to think of me as unclean. I'm so dirty. I don't want to bother him or touch him. He's the cleanest person I know. He's the cleanest person we will ever meet. And he's the solution to our issue. As we read in this definition in the Greek, it says to cause or to come forth. So Jesus was causing to come forth her miracle, her healing, her deliverance, her freedom, your issue is causing freedom. It's not there to destroy you. It's there to free you. It's not there to kill me. It's there to heal me. So our issue is bringing a change. Our issue is causing us to enter into the place that God wants us to be. And that's what Jesus does. He uses our issue as a way to bring us forth, just as he did with Lazarus, as he told him to come forth out of the grave. That issue, when we touch Jesus, is removed and we come forth out of the grave. The scripture says in 47, when the woman realized that she could not stay silent or quiet or hidden because Jesus knew somebody touched him, he said, who touched me? And he's looking all around. She couldn't stay quiet. She had to tell them it was me. The scripture says here, that she began to tremble and she fell to her knees in front of him. So she went from behind him to falling in front of him. She followed before she got in the front of him. And it says the whole crowd heard her explain why she touched him and what she had been immediately healed from. But 48 is the key. As we talk about Father's Day, oh God, he ate as the king. It says, daughter, he said to her, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. He didn't call her dirty. He didn't call her sinner. He didn't call her nasty. He didn't call her out of what she did. He called her daughter. He referenced her as his beloved. He referenced her as family, he referenced her as somebody that was a part of his DNA. So her being unclean was not a factor for the one that's completely clean. He's not looking at what we did wrong. He's not looking at what we feel like we can't stop doing. He sees us in spite of what our issue is. When she touched him, all of her issues were gone. The Bible says immediately, our issues are removed when we touch our father. Our identity is revealed when we touch our father. He knows every issue and will resolve them. He will use our issue and give us his virtue. He's using your issue to give you virtue. Oh God. What would happen if we saw our issue as a means to bring virtue? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. The suffering is a prerequisite to glory. She had to go through that to get to him. She couldn't just get to him if she didn't go through anything. She would have had no reason to seek the Savior. She would have had no reason to press through the crowd, to, to push through the crowd. She would have had no reason even though she was bleeding all over herself, she said, I got to touch him. And I know this means that I'm going to make him unclean. 
So I won't touch his body. I'll just touch his clothing because maybe then I'll still receive from him, but he won't be unclean. She had to realize that Jesus couldn't be made unclean. Nothing in us can change him. <laughs> it doesn't change him. It changes us. Thank you, Lord. What others look at as an issue, Jesus uses as an opportunity. We may have issues, and those issues are never too big for our Father. As I close, I want to leave you with this. Thank you, Jesus. This woman literally had to push through the crowd. I literally saw her on her hands and knees. She was literally crawling through this crowd. Think about that. How do you get to the hymn if you're not on your if you're not on your knees, if you're not on your face? And there's thousands of people. She had to push through them. She had to crawl through the crowd. And you know what was so amazing? The fact that she had an issue of blood, people began to move. Come on now, if you're around somebody that stinks, you gonna move out the way. If you're around somebody with a stench, you're like, oh God, what is that? You're gonna begin to scoot over. If you're around somebody that's bleeding all over the place, you're gonna begin to move out the way. So this issue actually made it easier for her to get to Jesus because her issue caused the people to lose their focus on Jesus and start looking at her. Now, what I love is she pushed through the crowd. We're going to have to push. Pray until something happens. We're going to have to push. Prophesy until something happens. We're going to have to push. Position ourselves before him until something happens. Are we positioning ourselves? Are we coming low? Are we going to the ground? Are we getting in a posture where we say, Jesus, if you don't help me, I cannot be helped. Are we getting in a position where we say, I don't care what it takes. I've got to get to the hem of him. I don't care what it takes. I just got to touch him. I don't care what I got to suffer. I don't care if they lock me up because I did something that's against the law. I just got to get to the Savior. No matter what your issue is, we got to get to the Savior. That's the end outcome to get to the Savior. Because when we get to him, everything we need is released. He said it came out of me. Let's touch him today. Let's touch the father because the father knows our issue. And when we touch him right, he heals us. When we touch him right, he frees us. When we touch him right, he forgives us. And we can touch him today. Let's touch the hem of his garment, the lowest place, because our lowest place is still the highest place in him. It was still the highest place in him. And even though it was the lowest place on his garment, let's reach that place in Jesus. Let's touch him no matter what it takes. Let's be so desperate to get to the master that we won't let anything stop us from getting to our father. Amen. I'm going to turn it over now. I'm going to turn it over to Apostle now so she can close us out.